Hello, Sears. This is an interview with Jens Jørn Nielsen from Denmark. I am Michelle Rasmussen, the Vice President of the Schiller Institute in Denmark. Uh, Jens Jørn Nielsen has degrees in the history of ideas and communication. He is a former Moscow correspondent for the major Danish daily Politiken. And uh, that was in the late 1990s. He's the author of several books about Russia and the Ukraine and a leader of the Russian Danish Dialogue Organization. Uh, in addition, he is Associate Professor of Communication and Cultural Differences at the Niels Brock Business College in Denmark. The Schiller Institute released a memorandum entitled, Are We Sleepwalking into Thermonuclear World War III on December 24th? In the beginning, it states, Ukraine is being used by geopolitical forces in the West that answer to the bankrupt speculative financial system as the flashpoint to trigger a strategic showdown with Russia a showdown which is already more dangerous than the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962 and which could easily end up in a thermonuclear war that no one will win and none would survive. Uh, Niels Jörn, in the past days, Russian President Putin and other high-level spokesmen have stated that Russia's red lines are about to be crossed and they have called for treaty negotiations to come back from the brink. What are these red lines and how dangerous is the current situation? Well, uh, thank you for inviting me. First, I would like to say, um, and I think yeah, the question you raised here about the red lines and, and the question also about are we sleepwalking on, into a new war? I think it's very relevant because as a historian, I know what happened in 1914 at, at uh, the beginning of the uh, First uh, World War and kind of sleepwalking. No one really wanted the war, actually, but it ended up and tens of million people uh, got killed uh, and then the whole world disappeared at this time and, and the world never became the same. So I think it's a very, very relevant question you are uh, asking here. And um, you asked me specifically about, um, about uh, Putin and the red lines. Of course, um, you can have the point of view. I heard that Clinton, uh, Bills and Hillary Clinton and John Kerry and many other American policies that say and claim that things like red lines, we don't have anymore. We don't have zones of influence anymore because we have a new world, we have a new liberal world and we don't have this kind of thing. It belongs to an, another century, another age, but um, uh, you could um, you can uh, somehow put the question: What actually are Americans doing in Ukraine, if not um, uh, not defending their own red lines? Because I think it's it's like if you have a, a, a power, a superpower, big power like Russia, I think it's very very natural that any superpowers would have some kind of red lines, because you can imagine what will happen if China, Iran, and Russia had a military. Uh, alliance uh, and uh, um, going into Mexico, Canada, Cuba may be also putting missiles up there. Uh, I don't think anyone would doubt what would happen at this thing. Uh, the American United States will never accept it, of course. So the Russians will, will normally ask, why should we accept that uh, Americans are dealing with Ukraine and preparing maybe to put up some military hardware in, in Ukraine? Why should we? And I think it's a very relevant question. And, and basically the Russians see it today as a question of power because the Russians actually have for, I would say 30 years, they have tried, they have tried. The Russians in 30 years ago, I was in Russia at this time, I speak Russian. Uh, I'm qu quite sure that the Russians at this time, they dreamt of being a part of the Western community. And they had very, very high thoughts about uh, the Western countries 
and Americans were extremely popular at this time. 80% of the Russian population in 1990 had very positive view uh, of, uh, of United States. Later on today, and even for some years already, 80%, the same percentage have negative view of Americans today. So something happened, not very positively, because there was, at, at 30 years ago, there were some prospects of a new world. There really were some ideas, but something, something actually was screwed up uh, in, in the 90s. I have some idea, maybe you can go in detail about it, but, but things screw up. And, and normally today, uh, many people in the West and universities, politicians, these things like that, say it's all the fault of Putin. It's Putin's fault, whatever happened, it's Putin's fault that now we are in a situation is very close to, to, um, to the Cuban missile crisis, which you also mentioned. Um, but I don't think it that way. I think, okay, it takes two to dance a tango. It's, it's, we know that, of course, but, but I think many Western politicians have failed to see the, um, uh, the compliance of, of, uh, of uh, the Western parts in this, because I think there are many things which, which, um, uh, which played a role that uh, we, we are in, the situ in a situation like that now. I think the, the basic thing when, if you look from a Russian point of view, it's the extension to the east of NATO. Uh, I think it's, it's a real bad thing because Russia was against it from the very beginning. Even Yeltsin, Boris Yeltsin, who was um, considered to be the man of the West, a democratic Russian, I think that he was very, very opposed to, to, to this NATO uh, the, um, uh, alliance going to east up to the borders of, of Russia. And we can see it now because as it recently has been released some new material uh, in America of, of, uh, of, um, of um, exchange of letters between uh, Yeltsin and Clinton at this time. So we know exactly that, that, um, that Yeltsin and uh, Kosherev, the uh, Russian um, Minister of Foreign Affairs at this time, were very much opposed to it. And then Putin came along, Putin, he came along not to impose uh, his will on the Russian people, but he came along because there was in, in, in Russia, there was a, a will to oppose this NATO, NATO extension uh, to the East. So I think things began at this point. And later on, we had the Georgian crisis in 2008. Uh, and we had, of course, the Ukraine crisis uh, 14, and also with Crimea and Donbass and all these kind of things. And, um, and now we are very, very close to, I don't think it's very likely we will have a war, but we are very close to it because I think that uh, uh, wars often begin by some kind of mistake, some accident, someone accidentally um, pulls a trigger or press a button somewhere and, and, and suddenly something happened. It's actually what happened uh, in, in 1914 uh, at the beginning of the First um, uh, World War, actually there was uh, one who was shot in Sarajevo, everyone knows uh, about that. And things like that could happen. And for us living in Europe, it, it's awful to think about having a war. We can hate Putin, we can do, think whatever we like, but, but the thought of a nuclear war is um, horrible for, for all of us. And that's why I think that politicians could come to their senses. And I think also that this, this um, demonization of Russia and demonization of Putin is very bad, of course, for the Russians, but it's very bad for us here in, in the West, for us in Europe and also in America. I don't think it's very good for our democracy. I don't think it's very good. Uh, I don't see very many, um, very, how to say it, uh, healthy perspectives uh, in this act. I don't see any at all uh, because I see some other prospects because we, we could cooperate in another way. There are possibilities, of course, uh, which are not being used, uh, uh, not, not being um, uh, put into praxis, uh, which it, it uh, certainly could. So, um, so yes, your question is very, very relevant, and we can talk uh, in, at length uh, uh, about it. But, but, but I think it, it's very, and I'm very happy that you you asked this question because. Pretty few ask these questions uh, today in Danish, well, in Western media at all, and, and, and because everyone, you know, think that it's 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 enough, but just to say that well, Putin is a scoundrel. Putin 
it's a crook and, and uh, everything is good. No, we have to get along. We have to find some ways to cooperate uh, because otherwise it'd be the demise of all of us. Can, can you just go through a little bit more of the history of the uh, ex NATO expansion uh, towards the east and what we're speaking about in terms of the proposed treaties that Russia, Russia has come out with is yeah. to prevent, for the one, firstly, to prevent Ukraine from becoming a formal member of NATO and secondly, to prevent the uh, general expansion of NATO, both in terms of soldiers and military uh, equipment towards, towards the east. So can you speak about this and also in terms of uh, the broken promises from the Western side? <clears throat> Yes, um, actually, uh, what the story goes back to the beginning of the 90s. Actually, had, I, I had a long talk with Mikhail Gorbachev, the former leader of Soviet Union, in 1989, just when, um, when NATO uh, started to bomb uh, Serbia and when they adopted Poland, Czech Republic and uh, Hungary in, in NATO. At this time, I had a long talk with, with Gorbachev, who was um, Gorbachev, you, also, you should bear in mind that Gorbachev is a very nice person. He's a very lively person with good humor, the spirited person. But when we start to talk, I asked him about this uh, uh, concerning the NATO expansion, which was going on the day, exactly the day where we were talking. He was became very gloomy, very uh, sad because he said, well, I talked to James Baker uh, Helmut Kohl from Germany and several other persons, and they all promised me an inch to the east if uh, Soviet Union would let uh, um, Germany unite GDR and, and West Germany unite to one country, and uh, that country being a member of NATO, but not uh, an inch to, to the east. So I think also some of the new material which have been released, I have read some of it, some are on uh, WikiLeaks, some you can find, uh, it's, it's, it's declassified. It's very interesting. So there's no doubt at all there was some oral uh, spoken promises to, to Mikhail Gorbachev. It was not written because, as he said, I believed them. Mm. I can see I was naive. So I think th this is a key, I think, to Putin today uh, to understand why, uh, why Putin today, he wants not only sweet words, he wants something uh, based on a treaty uh, because basically he doesn't really believe he, the trust, the level of trust between uh, Russia and, and uh, NATO countries is very, very low today. And it's a problem, of course, uh, and, and I don't think we can overcome it in, in, in a few years. It takes times to build trust, but the trust is not there uh, for the time being. Uh, and and but but then you know the the NATO uh, expansion has gone like step by step by step. First it was uh, the three countries, Poland, Hungary, and the Czech Republic, and then came well uh, in two thousand and four. Uh, it was six years later. Came among other things the Baltic republics, and Slovakia, Romania, and and Bulgaria, and and the other countries later on, uh, Albania, uh, Croatia, and things like that. And, and, and they couldn't see. And then in 2008, there was a NATO summit in Bucharest, where George Bush, the president of the United States, he promised Georgia and Ukraine membership of, of uh, NATO. Um, Putin was president. He was uh, not president at this time. He was uh, prime minister in Russia because president was Medvedev. But he was very angry at this time. But what could he do? And but he said, you know, at this point, he said very, very clearly, we would not accept it because our red lines would be crossed here. We have accepted the Baltic states. We have gone, we have uh, retreated. We've gone back. We've been going back for several years. And and um, and uh, but but still, you know, uh, it was not off the table. It's all because Germany and France they did not accept it because Merkel at, at um, Hollande at this time. Uh, did not accept Ukraine and, uh, and Georgia as member of NATO, but the uh, United States they pressed for it, and it, it's still on the agenda of the United States that Georgia and Ukraine should be a member of NATO. 
so um, there was a small war in um, in August the same year, a few months after this NATO summit, where actually it was Georgia who attacked South Ossetia. It was a part, it was a minority part of, of Georgia. It's a long story, but it was Georgia who, who attacked. And you could say that George W. Bush, he promised Saakashvili, he should just attack Russia and we will come to your aid. We will help you. Uh, Georgia attacked. What happened? Five years. Uh, the Russian army, which of course was much, much bigger than the Georgian, they smashed the Georgian army in five days and retreated. No help from the United States. And I, I think that from a moral point of view, I don't think it's a very wise policy because you can't say, well, you just go on fight, we will help you. But when the Russian uh, fire back, which certainly they did at the time, uh, well, oh no, we will not help you anyway. I, I think it's, I think from a moral point of view, it's not, well, it's not, it's not very fair, but actually it's the same, which seems to be happening now in, in Ukraine. And, and um, in Ukraine, even there was what I would call, I would call a coup, um, a state, uh, orchestrated state coup in 2014. I know it's a very, um, a very different opinions about this, but my opinion is that there was a kind of coup uh, to, to oust the sitting the incumbent president, um, Yanukovych, Viktor Yanukovych, and replace it with one which is very, very keen on getting into NATO. Yanukovych was not very keen on uh, going to NATO, but he still had the majority of the population. And, and, and it's interesting, in, in Ukraine, there's been a lot of opinion polls, opinion polls conducted by, by Germans, Americans, uh, France, uh, Europeans, Russian, Ukraine, and, and so on. And all these uh, opinion polls show that the majority of Ukrainian people did not want to join NATO. So, uh, uh, and that after that, of course, things moved very quickly because Crimea was a very, very sensitive question for Russia for many reasons. Because first, it was a contested area because it was very from the very beginning, from 1991, when Ukraine uh, was independent. That was not an amateur about what um, Crimea, because a major part of, uh, of Crimea is, is Russian speaking uh, and, and is very culturally close to Russia. In, in terms of history, uh, it's very close to Russia. It's one of the most patriotic parts of Russia, actually. So it, it's a very odd part of, of Ukraine uh, in general. It was and always was a very odd part of, of, of Ukraine. And, and so uh, I, I have no doubt at all that the majority of the people in a conflict were the new government. The first thing the new government did in February 2014, it was to forbid uh, the, the Russian language as a language which had been used in local administration and, and, and things like that. And it was some of the stupidest, one of the most stupid things you could do in such a very tense situation. Ukraine basically is a very cleft uh, society. It's a very cleft society. The eastern and southern part are very close to Russia. They speak Russian and uh, very close to Russian culture. The, the western part, uh, the westernmost part uh, about Lviv is a very uh, close to, to the very closer to Poland and, and uh, Austria and things like that. So it's a cleft society. And in such a society, you can do well, you have some options. One option is to, to embrace uh, all the parts of society, different parts of society. Or you can also, you can, which after what, what's happened, you can also, one part can, you know, uh, impose its will on the other part against its will. And it was actually what happened. So there are several crises. There are a crisis in Ukraine with two uh, approximately equally sized parts of Ukraine. But you also have, on the other hand, the Russian NATO uh, question also. So, so you had two crises and they stumbled together and they were uh, pressed together in uh, 2014. So you had a very explosive uh, situation uh, which uh, actually has not been solved uh, until this day. And for Ukraine, it, it, it's, it's all, all, I say, as long as you have this conflict between Russia and NATO, I think it's impossible to solve uh, one way because 
it's one of the most corrupt societies, one of the most uh, poor societies in Europe uh, right now. And a lot of people come to Denmark, where we are now, uh, Germany, and, and also to Russia. Millions of Ukrainians have, have got abroad to work because it's really uh, pro uh, many, many social problems, economical problems, things like that. So, so um, and that's why Putin, if we remember what um, Gorbachev, he told me about having things on paper, uh, on treaties, which are signed. And that's why um, Putin said, I, he, what he actually said to the West, I don't really believe you. Because you, when you can, you cheat. He didn't put it that, that way, but uh, it was actually what he meant. So uh, now I tell you very, very, uh, very uh, outright, very clearly, what our points of view are. We have red lines, like you have red lines. Don't try to overstep them. And, and um, I think many people in the West do not like it. I think it's very clear because I think the red lines are, if you compare historically, they're very reasonable. If you compare the United States and the Monroe Doctrine, which is still in power in, in, in USA, they're very, very reasonable uh, red lines. Uh, so much more that I would say that Ukraine, many of Ukrainians are very close to Russian. I have many Ukrainian friends. I, I sometimes forget the Ukrainians because their language, their first language is actually Russian. Also close to Russian. So those being a part of an anti-Russian military pact, it's simply, it's simply madness. It's simply, uh, it, it, it's, it's, um, it cannot work. It will not work. Such a country would never be a normal country in many, many years forever. And, and I think much of the blame could be put on the NATO expansion and those politicians who have been pressing for that for, for several years. And, and I would say the first and I would say Bill Clinton was the first one. Madam Albright uh, from the 1993, they all, uh, at this time, they adopted the policy of NATO expansion, uh, to, to extension to the East. And uh, George W. Bush, he also pressed for Ukraine uh, and Georgia uh, becoming member of, of NATO. And every, for every step that was, um, uh, that was in, 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 in Russia, you had uh, people, rallying around the flag, you could put it that way, because you have a, a pressure. And, and the more we press uh, with, uh, with NATO, the more the Russians will rally around the flag and the more authoritarian Russia will be. So we are in, in this situation. So the things now happening in Russia, which I can uh, admit I do not like, about uh, closing some offices, closing some media, something, I do not like it at all. But uh, and in, in, in a in a type of confrontation, I think it's quite reasonable, reasonable, understandable. Even I would not uh, defend it, but but it's understandable because the United States also after 9/11 also uh, adopted a lot of um, uh, defensive measures and, and, and kind of censorship and things like that. So it's what's happened when you have uh, such um, tense situations when you have when you have such kind of things. Um, we should just also bear in mind that that Russia and the uh, United States are the two countries which uh, possess 90% uh, of the world's nuclear armament. Uh, so uh, alone, the, I would say the mere thought of them using some of this is, is like, you know, it's a doomsday perspective because it will not be a, a, a small, tiny war like Second World War. It might, it will dwarf a second world war because billions will die in this. And, and it's, it, it's a question if we, humanity will survive. So it's, it's a very, very great question. And I, I think we should ask that, that if the right of the Ukraine to have membership with its own population do not really want, is it really worth the risk of a nuclear war? Uh, it's how uh, I, I would put it, and, and uh, I'm not taking any, all blame uh, away from Russia. It's not my point here. My point is that the, this question is too uh, important just to. It, it's it's a very relevant. It, it's very it's very important that we a kind of modus vivendi, a kind of 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 of, of also. Um, I think it's a problem for the West. I think it's very important also that we learn in the West how to cope with people who are not like us. 
because we tend to think that people should become Democrats like we are Democrats, and only then will we deal with them. If they are not Democrats like we are Democrats, we will do everything we can to make them Democrats. We will support people who want to, to, to make a revolution in this country so they become like us. It's a very, very dangerous, dangerous way of thinking. Uh, and, and a destructive way of thinking. And, um, and I think that, that um, we in the West, we should study maybe a little more what is happening in, in, the, in other uh, organizations where the West is not dominating. I'm thinking about the BRICS is one organization. I'm thinking also about Shanghai uh, Cooperation Organization with, uh, where uh, Asian countries basically, also some other countries, but basically Asian countries are uh, cooperating and they're not changing each other. They are not demanding that, the Chinese are not demanding that, that we should all be Confucianist and, and, and the Russians are not demanding that all people in the world should be Orthodox Christians and, 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 and et cetera, et cetera. I think it's very, very important that we bear in mind that, that we should uh, cope with each other like we are and not demand changes. I think it's, it's, it's a really dangerous and stupid game to play. I think the European Union is also very uh, active in this this uh, this game, uh, which I, 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 I think is very very well. This way of thinking has, in my point of view, no perspective, no positive perspectives at all. Uh, actually, today Presidents Biden and Putin will speak on the phone, and important diplomatic. Uh, meetings are scheduled for the middle of January. What is what is going to determine if diplomacy can avoid a disaster as during the Cuban uh, Missile Crisis? Some people are actually calling this a reverse. Helga Zeplarouche has just called this a reverse uh, missile crisis. Yeah. Or if Russia will feel that they have no uh, alternative to having a military response, as they openly have stated, what they, changes on the Western side are necessary? If you had President Biden uh, alone in a room uh, and or other heads of state of NATO countries, what would you say to them? I would say, look, Joe, um, I understand your concerns. I understand that you have you, you see yourself as a champion, some freedom in the world and things like that. I understand some positive things about it. But you see the game you now are playing with Russia is a very, very dangerous game. And, and, and the Russians um, is a very proud people. You cannot force them. Uh, it, it's not an option. I mean, you cannot, because it, it has been American and to some degree also European Union policy to change Russia, to very much like to change. Um, uh, uh, so, so they'll have, so they'll have another president and, and exchange Putin for another president. But I can assure you, if I should take to Joe Biden, Joe Biden, you're sure if you uh, if you succeed or if Putin dies tomorrow, or somehow they'll have a new president, I can assure that he'll be just as tough as Putin, maybe even tougher. Because in Russia, you have much tougher people. Many blame, actually. I would say even most people in Russia uh, who blame Putin, blame them, blame him because he's not tough enough on the West, because he's too soft on the West, he's too liberal on the West. Uh, and many people have blamed him for not taking the eastern, southern part of uh, Ukraine, yet he should have done it. So, 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 um, if I uh, would say to Biden, you should, I think it will be wise for you right now to support Putin or to deal with Putin, engage with Putin and, and, and do some uh, diplomacy because, because the alternative is a possibility of war. And you should not go into history, well, as, as uh, the American president who uh, secured the extension of humanity. Uh, it was very, very, very bad record for you and, and, and there are possibilities because I don't think Putin is unreasonable. He, um, uh, Russia has not been uh, unreasonable. I think they had turned back. They have, uh, because in, in 1991, it was Russian self who disbanded the Soviet, the Soviet uh, Union 
there was the Russians, uh, the Moscow who disbanded the Warsaw Pact, the Russians who gave the liberty to Baltic countries and all other Soviet republics, and with hardly any any shot, any uh, and, and they turned half a, a million uh, Soviet soldiers back to Russia. No shot was fired at at all. Uh, I think it's 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 extraordinary if you compare what happened to 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 uh, the, this membership of of the French. And the British colonial empire after the Second World War, well, it was very, um, very civilized in, in in many ways. So, so stop thinking about Russian as uncivilized, um, stupid people uh, who don't understand anything but but mere power. Russians understand, and Russian is an educated people. They understand a lot of arguments, <coughs> and they are interested in, in cooperating. So, uh, and and there will be a lot of. Uh, advantages for United States and also for the West and also for the European Union to uh, to end kind of uh, more uh, productive, more pragmatic relationship uh, cooperation. There are a lot of things in terms of energy, climate, of course, uh, and 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 uh, terrorism and, and 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 many other things where it's a win-win situation to cooperate with it. The only thing Russian answer uh, is, is asking for is not to put your military hardware in our back garden, uh, which I, I uh, which I think is 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 I don't think it, it it's it's a very I don't think it's 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 a, a blowing I don't think it's it's it could it it should be hard for us to accept certainly not to understand uh, why the Russians think like that and they should they can think back on the history. Where people, where, where armies from the West have attacked Russia, uh, so th they have in their genes. They were in all. I don't think there are any person in Russia who have forgot or are not aware of, of the huge losses the Soviet Union felt on uh, Nazi Germany uh, in in um, in the 1940s uh, during the Second World War, and you had Napoleon also trying to to. You have a lot of have experiences with people, with armies from the West. Going, uh, going uh, into Russia, so it's it's very, very lying, very, very deep. So either was it, was it like twenty million people who died? Yeah, in, the, in the Soviet Union, it, it was also Ukrainians and and other nationalities. But Soviet Union, it was a problem. I think it was like eighteen million Russians, if you can count it, because it was the Soviet Union. But seven, 27 million people. It's a huge part, and because Russia has experience with war, so the Russians would certainly not like war. I think the Russians have uh, experience with war that that and Europeans to some part also that the United States do not have, uh, because the, the the attack I remember in in, in recent time it's an attack, uh, 20, uh, 11, uh, 9 11 uh, on a, 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 the Twin Tower in New York. Because otherwise, the United States do not have experiences. It tends uh, tend to think more in ideological terms, and 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 where the Russians certainly, but also to some extent, some people in Europe think more in pragmatic, more in, in in we should for at any cost avoid war, because war is, is a, 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 it doesn't it creates more problems than it solves. So, so, uh, so have some pragmatic cooperation. It will not be very a love affair, of course not, but it will be on a very pragmatic. pragmatic. Also, in terms of uh, dealing with this horrible humanitarian situation in Afghanistan, I and think cooperating so. on yeah, the pan sure. pandemic. Yeah, 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 yeah. Of, of course, there are, there are possibilities. Right now, it, it's like um, we can't even cooperate. In terms of vaccines, and, and uh, th there's so many going on from both sides, actually, because we are um, don't really have we have very very little contact between uh, today. If you watch, I had some I had some plans to to make some uh, cooperation between Danish and Russian universities in terms of business development, things like that. But it turned out there was not not one crown as our currency. Um, you could have you could have projects in Southern America, Africa, all, all other countries. More well, not yeah, but not Russia, which is a stupid. I, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about that because you wrote two books, recent books about Russia. Uh, one is called On His Own Terms: uh, Putin and the New Russia, 
and the latest one just from September, uh, Russia against the grain. Yeah. And many people in West in the West uh, portray Russia as the enemy, which is solely responsible for the current situation, yeah. and uh, Putin as a dictator who is threatening his neighbors militarily and threatening the democracy of the free world. Uh, over and above what you have already said, uh, is, is this true or, or do you have a different viewpoint? Of course I have a different point of view because I think well, well uh, Russia is for me it's not a perfect country because such country does not exceed not even Denmark some suppose it is but there's no such thing as a perfect society because societies are always you know developing from somewhere to somewhere and Russia likewise and Russia it has is a very very big country so you can definitely find things which are not very uh, likable in, in, in Russia, definitely. It's not my point here, but, but I think that in the West, I think for, actually for centuries, we have, if you look back, I have tried in the recent book, um, my, my latest book, I tried to find out how Western philosophers, how uh, church people, how they look at Russia from centuries back. And there has been, a, a, there's been kind of a red, threat yours. There's been a kind of continuation because Russia has very, very, very often been uh, characterized as, as our adversary, as a, a, a country against basic European values. 500 years back, it was against a Roman Catholic, Catholic Church. And, and uh, in, in, uh, in 17, 1800, it was against the Enlightenment philosophers. And, and, and in, in um, and in, in, uh, in the 19th, uh, 20th century, it was about, you know, there was a communism thing and it's also split people in the West and it was also considered to be a threat, but it's also considered to be a, a threat today, even though Putin is not a communist, maybe he is, but he's not a communist, he's a conservative, a moderate conservative, I, I, I would say, but, but, but uh, and even during the time of Yeltsin, it was also considered, it was a liberal and pro-West and he loved the West and followed the West in all, almost all things they, 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 um, they proposed. Uh, but still, there's something with Russia, which I think from, from a philosophical point of view, is very important to, to find out that we have some, some very deep-rooted um, prejudices uh, about Russia. Uh, and, and I think it, it, it plays a role because I, I hear it often when I speak to people who say Russia is an awful country and Putin is, is, is simply, um, he, he, is, um, he, he is a very, very evil person. He's a dictator. Have you been in Russia? Do you know any Russians? No, not really. Okay, but what do you base your points of view on? Well, what I read in the newspapers, uh, of course, what I, they tell me in, 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 a news, in a television. And... and well, well, I think it's got not good enough because, because, uh, and I understand why the Russians, I think on, on a, when I, I very often talk to Russian politicians and other people and, and what they are sick and tired of is, you know, this notion that, that, that the West is better. We are on a higher level. And if Russians should be accepted, uh, from the West, they should become like us, or at least they should admit that they are on a lower level according uh, to, uh, in, in relation to our very high level. And that's why when they deal with China, when they deal with India, and when they deal with African countries and even Latin American countries, they don't meet such attitudes. Because they are on a more equal term, they're different, yes, but, but they don't, one does not consider each other to be higher on a higher level. And that's why I think that cooperation in, in BRICS, which we talked about, and, 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 and the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, I think the, it's very, quite successful. And I don't know about the future, but I have a very, I have a feeling that, that if you, we're talking about Afghanistan, I think if, if Afghanistan could be integrated to this kind of organization one way or another, I have a feeling it probably would be more successful than the 20 years that the NATO countries has been there. 
so so um, so I think that culture attitude it plays a role when we're talking about politics because a lot of the policy um, from American European side um, is very actually very emotional. Uh, it's very like we have some feelings. We fear Russia. We don't like it, or, or, or we think that it's awful. And our ideas, we have, we know how to how to run a society much better than the Russians and the Chinese and the Indians and 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 and, and the Muslims and things like that. And and I think it's a part of the problem. That it's a part of our problem in, in the West. It's a part of our way of thinking, our uh, philosophy which I think we, we should have a closer look at and, and, and criticize. But it's difficult because it's, it's very deep rooted. When I, when I discuss with people at universities, in media and, and, and other, uh, other places, uh, I, I encounter this. That's why I wrote this, the latest book because it's very much about uh, our way of thinking about Russia. And that's why the book is, is about Russia, of course, but it's also about us our glasses, how we uh, perceive uh, Russia, how we perceive not only Russia, but it also goes for China, because it's, it's more or less, it's not the same, but there are many similarities, uh, how, we, how we look upon Russia, and how we look upon uh, and, and perceive uh, China and, and other countries. And uh, so, so I think this is a very, very, very important thing we have to, we have to deal with. Because we have to do it. Because otherwise, uh, if we decide, or America, or Russia decides, they decide to use all the firework they have of nuclear firework, then it's the end. As the, because you can put it is very sharp to put it like that, and people will not like it. But basically, we 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 are facing this these two alternatives. Either we find ways to cooperate with people who are not like us. And will not be, certainly not in my lifetime, like us, uh, and accept them that they are not like us, and get on like we can, and keep our differences, but respect each other. I think that's what we, that what, what we need from the Western countries. I think it's it's, it's a basic problem uh, today dealing with other countries, and the same goes. For, I have uh, said uh, for China. Um, I, I do not know Chinese language, and I've been in China, I know a little about China, Russian, I know very well, I speak Russian, uh, so I know how Russians are thinking about this, what they're feeling about this, and, and uh, I think it's, it's important to deal with these questions. Yeah, you also pointed out, I think, uh, that in 2001, after the attack against the World Trade Center, yeah. I think Putin was the first one to call yeah, sure, sure, you know, sure. George Bush yeah, and yeah. offered cooperation yes, and yes. Uh, about dealing with terrorism. Yes, yes. But, certainly. but and I think you've written that he had a pro-Western sure, pro yeah. worldview, but that this was not reciprocated. Um, sure, sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, 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 so because he had actually he was uh, criticized from the military and from also politicians in the beginning of his first term in 2000, 2001, 2002, he was criticized because he was too happy for America. He even said in an interview in the BBC that he would like Russia to become a member of NATO. It did not happen because <laughs> uh, there are many reasons for that, but, but he was very, very keen. That's also why he felt very betrayed afterward. And, and in 2007 at the Munich, uh, conference of security in February in Munich in Germany. Well, he said he, he was very uh, frustrated and it was very uh, clear that he felt um, he felt betrayed by the West. He thought that they had a common agenda. He thought that Russia should become a member, but Russia probably is too big. And uh, if you consider Russia becoming a member of European Union, European Union will change thoroughly. But they failed. Russia not become a member, it's, it's understandable, but then I think European Union should have found again a modus vivendi. Okay, we okay, they cannot a become- way, way of living together. Yeah, how would we live together? 
because they uh, joined, uh, it was actually a, a parallel development of European Union and NATO against Russia. In 2009, the European Union, they invited Georgia, Ukraine, Belarus, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Georgia uh, to the European Union, but not Russia. Even though they knew that, that there was a, really a lot of trade between Ukraine, also Georgia and Russia, and it would have interfered, but they did not pay attention to Russia. So Russia was left out at this time. And, and so eventually, you could say uh, understandably, very understandably, Russia turned to China. And in China, um, cooperation with China, they became stronger. They uh, became much more self-confident. And uh, they also cooperated with people who respected them much more. Uh, so uh, it's, I think that's interesting that the Chinese understood how to deal with other people with respect that the Europeans and Americans did not. Um, just be before we go to our last questions, I, I want to go back to this with Ukraine because it's it's so important. Uh, you said that 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 the the problem did not start with the so-called annexation of Crimea, but with what you called a, a coup uh, against the sitting president. Yeah. Can you just explain more about that? Because in the West, it's like everybody says, oh, well, the problem started when Russia annexed uh, Crimea. Yeah, yeah. Oh, OK, there are many. Well, I, if you take Ukraine, you can say in 2010, there was a presidential election and the OSCE. Uh, they uh, monitored the election, said it was very good, and the majority voted for Viktor Yanukovych. Viktor Yanukovych, he did not want Ukraine to become a member of NATO. He wanted to cooperate with the European Union, but he also wanted to keep cooperating with Russia. Basically, that's how he was like, but it's very, it's, it's very often claimed that he was corrupt. Yes, I don't doubt it, but name me one president who has not been corrupt. That's not the big difference. It's not the big thing, uh, I, I would say, but... Um, but then in 2012, there was a par parliamentary election in Ukraine also, and uh, Yanukovych's party also gained majority with some other parties. There was coalition, supported Yanukovych's policy, not becoming a member of NATO. And, and then uh, he, uh, there was, um, um, there was a development where the European Union and uh, Ukraine were supposed to sign a, a treaty of cooperation, but he found out that the treaty would be very costly for Ukraine because they would open the borders for European, European uh, firms uh, from, from European Union. And um, I th think they, uh, the Ukraine, the Ukrainian firms would not be able to cooperate, to, to compete with, with the Western firms. Secondly, and this is the most important thing, basic industry, in export, the basic um, uh, the basic um, import from Ukraine was to Russia and was industrial products from the eastern part, from Dnepropetrovsk, Dnepro is called today, from Donetsk, from Luhansk, and from Kivarok, uh, from some other parts, basically in the eastern part, with an industrial part of Ukraine. And they made some calculations showing that, well, if you join this agreement, the Russia said, we will have to some, put some taxes on or all you export because you will have some free import from European Union. So of course we we have we don't have an agreement with European Union. So of course anything which comes from you will be that will be imposed uh, some some taxes on it. And, and then um, Yanukovych said, well, 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 it doesn't sound good. And he wanted to uh, Russia, European Union, and Ukraine go together and treat what we call. Uh, triangle uh, uh, agreement, but the European Union was very much opposed to it because it didn't want, even though you could say the eastern part of Ukraine was economically a part of Russia. A lot of the weapon industry from, from Russian weapon industry was actually in the eastern part of Ukraine, and there were Russian speakers there. And the and, uh, European Union said, no, we should not. Uh, Russia has no any stake in this. so. 
So, uh, Excuse um, me, there was a fallout. We should not, what? We, 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 um, um, European Union, they said we should not cooperate with Russia about this because Yanukovych, he wanted to have a, 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 a cooperation between European Union, Ukraine, and, uh, and, and uh, European Union, which sounds very sensible to me. Of course, it should be like that. It will be the advantage of all three parts. But, but European Union has, has a very ideological approach to this. So they were very much against uh, 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 Russia. It also you know, you know, increased the Russian suspicion that European Union was only a stepstone to NATO membership. And, and uh, then what happened was that there was a conflict in, in, in uh, there was demonstrations every day, Maidan in Kiev. There were many thousands of uh, people there. Um, and there were also shootings because many of the demonstrators were armed people. They have stolen weapons from from barracks in in, in the West. And and um, and at this point, when 100 people have been killed, European Union foreign ministers from France, Germany and Poland, they met uh, up and there was also a representative from Russia and there was Yanukovych, a representative of his government and from the opposition. And they made an agreement, okay, you should have uh, elections this year in for half a year, and you should have some sharing of power. People from opposition should become, should be member of, of a government and things like that. But all of a sudden, you know, things broke down and, and, um, and Yanukovych fled because you should remember, and it very often in the West, they tend to forget that the, that the um, uh, demonstrators were armed and they killed police people also. They killed people from Yanukovych's party, party of regions and things like that. So, so it, it's always, they're portrayed as innocent, peaceful, loving demonstrators. They were not at all. And some of them have very dubious uh, points of view with Nazi uh, swastika and things like that. Um, and uh, Yanukovych fled and then they came to power. They had no legitimacy. There's not a legitimate government because, because many of, of the members of parliament from, from this part of region, regions which has supported uh, Yanukovych, they have fled to the east. So the parliament was not able to make any decision. Still, there was a new president, uh, there was a new government who was basically from the western part of Ukraine. And the first thing they did, uh, I have told you, was you right. know, to quit the Russian language. And then they would talk about NATO membership. And Victoria Newland was there all the time. The vice uh, foreign minister of the United States was there all the time. There were many people from the West also. So things broke totally. And, and there were, there's actually been accusations since then that there were provo provocateurs who were killed. Yeah, yeah, definitely. People definitely. on both sides. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. And, and what's interesting, because there's been no investigation whatsoever about it, because a new government did not want to, to conduct in, in, in investigation as to who killed them. So, so, uh, so it was an orchestra, there's no doubt in my mind, it was an orchestrated coup, uh, no doubt about it. And, and that's Russian, that's the basic, that's a context for decision of Putin to accept Crimea uh, as a part of Russia, you, you should say, but normally you would say in the Western part that, that Crimea, <clears throat> that Russia simply annexed Crimea. It's not precisely what happened because there was a parliament in, 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 in a, as a local parliament because it was an autonomous part of Ukraine and they had their own parliament. And they made the decision that they should have a, <coughs> a referendum and, and um, which they had in, in March. And then they uh, applied you know, to become a member of Russian Federation. And it's, it's not a surprise, even though the Ukrainian army did not go there. Because there wasn't Ukrainian army, there was 20, 21,000 uh, Ukrainian soldiers. 14,000 of these soldiers that joined the Russian army. Uh, so, so it tells a little about that things were not like a normal, you know, say, annexation, where one country simply occupies part of the other country. Because you had this, this cleft country, you had this part, <clears throat> especially the southern part, which were very, very pro-Russian, has always been. Uh, and, and so, uh, of course, you could say that you were, um, there are a lot of things in terms of international law 
you can you can say about it because but I have no doubt uh, if you can look upon them differently because if you look at from the point of uh, Krim people who who live in Crimea, they did not want because they have almost 80, 90 percent have voted for party of regions, which Yanukovych party as a pro-Russian party, you could say. Nine, um, almost 87 or something. They have voted for this party. This party, this they have a center, a central building in, in Kiev was attacked, burned, three people were killed. So you could imagine that they would not um, they would not be very happy. Well, to put it this way, they would not be very happy with the new government and the new development. Of course not. They hated it. <clears throat> so, um, and what's what I think is very critical about the West is that they simply accepted uh, they accepted this horrible things in Ukraine just to have the price, just to have this prey like Ukraine in NATO. And and Putin was aware that he could not live. Be not even physically, but certainly not politically. If Sevastopol was a harbor for the Russian fleet, it became a NATO harbor. It was impossible. You, you, I, I know people from military say no, no way. It's impossible. Uh, it, it, you know, would would Chinese take San Diego in the United States? Of course not. <laughs> it goes without saying at, at that um, such things happen. So, so lag in the West is just a little bit of realism uh, how 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 powers how uh, how superpowers they think and how uh, about red lines of superpowers because we have an idea in the west about the new liberal world order it sounds very nice when you're sitting in an office in washington it sounds very beautiful and, and easy but go out and make this liberal world order it's not that simple and you cannot do it like 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 certainly not do it like they did in ukraine uh, in, regime uh, change. Regime change, yeah. Yeah, I have two other questions, the last questions. Uh, the <clears throat> Russian-Danish dialogue organization yeah. that you are a, a leader of and the Schiller Institute in Denmark, together with the China Cultural, the China Culture yeah, Center, yeah, yeah. Center in, uh, in Copenhagen, uh, were co-sponsors of three very successful musical yes. dialogue of cultures yeah. concerts with musicians from Russia, China, many other countries. Yeah. And you were actually an associate professor in cultural differences. Yeah, yeah. How do you see that, how would an increase in cultural exchange improve the situation? Well, it, it cannot but improve because we have very little, as I told you also. So I think uh, I'm actually also very, very happy with this cooperation because I think it's a very enjoyable uh, the, these musical um, events. It's very, very enjoyable and very interesting also for many Danish people because um, um, because when you have the language of music is better than the language of weapon, if I can put it that way, of course. And, and, and um, uh, but, but I also think that when we meet each other, when we listen to each other's music uh, and share culture in, in terms of films, literature, uh, paintings, whatever. Um, I think it, it's also, well, it's a natural thing, first of all. And it's, it's unnatural not to have it. We do not have it because maybe some people want it. If people want us to be uh, on, 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 on in a kind of tense situation, they would not like to have it. Because um, I think without it, it will, well, without this such kind of it's just a small thing, of course, but without this cultural exchanges, well, you will be very, very bad off. You will have a world which is much, much worse, uh, I think. And, and we should learn to enjoy the cultural expressions of other people. We should learn to accept them also. We should learn to, to also cooperate and also find ways. We are different, but we are also, we have a lot of things in common. And, and, and the things we have in common is very important not to forget that uh, even with Russians and even with Chinese also, uh, all, all other people, we have a lot in common. And it's very important to bear in mind that, that we should never forget that we have a lot of things in common. Basically, we have the basic values we have in common, even though we, if you are Hindu 
a Confucianist, a Russian Orthodox, we have a lot of things in common. It's, and when you have such kind of encounters, like in in in, in, in cultural uh, uh, in cultural affairs, in in, in uh, music and things like that, you become aware of it because suddenly it's much easier to understand people if you listen to this music. Maybe you should listen a, a few times, but it becomes very very interesting. You become a curious about instruments, way of singing, and, and whatever, whatever it is. So I hope Corona situation will allow us also to make some more concert. I think it should be, because they're very popular also in Denmark. Yeah, as Sheila wrote, it's through beauty we arrive at political freedom. We can also yeah, say it's yeah. through, through beauty that we can arrive at, at peace. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, the right. Schiller Institute and uh, and Helga Zeppler Rouge, its founder and international president, uh, we are leading an international campaign uh, to prevent World War III, for peace through economic development and a dialogue amongst cultures. H how do you see the role of the Schiller Institute? Well, uh, I, I know it. Uh, we have been cooperating. I think you have some. Uh, I think your your basic calls for uh, appeals to 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 um, to global development. I think it's very very interesting, uh, and I share your basic point of view. I think maybe it's a little difficult. There are many, you know, the devil is in the detail because it's it's. Uh, but but basically, I think, and I. It's what you uh, what you are thinking about when I talk about this uh, Silk Road, when I talked uh, about this Chinese programs, um, built and road programs. I, I see much more successful development that we have seen, say in Africa and European countries developing, because I have seen how they have been developing in, in Africa and, and other parts of the world, and it has not been really successful because it, it has been, uh, it has distorted many ways, many places in Africa, they distort development. I can see, um, I'm not uncritical to China, but, but, but of course I can see perspectives. I can see really, really good perspectives because on, on, just look at the railroads in China, for instance, it's a much, uh, for fast trains, uh, it's much bigger than, than anywhere else in the world. I think there are some perspectives with really, which I think attract first and foremost people of Asia, but I think eventually also people in Europe, because I also think that this, this model is becoming more and more, it's also beginning in the Eastern part, some countries of Eastern Europe are becoming interested. So I think it's, it's, it's um, I think it's very interesting, your, your, points of, uh, your points of view. I think they're very relevant uh, also because I think we are in a dead end alley for the Western, uh, what we are in, in right now. So people anyway are looking for new perspectives. And, and what you come up with, I think is a very, very interesting one, certainly. Um, what it may be in the future is difficult to say because things are difficult, but, but the basic things what you think about and what I have heard about the Chiller Institute also, because also think that you, 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 um, you, you, um, you stresses the, the importance of of uh, tolerance. You stresses the importance of multicultural society. That we should not change each other. We should cooperate on the basis of mutual interest, not chaining each other. And what what I have told you, th this is what I see as one of the real, real big problems in the Western mind, the Western way of thinking, that we should decide what should happen in the world. As if we have, we still think we are colonial powers, like we have been for some hundred years. But these times are over. There are new times ahead, uh, and and we should find new ways of thinking. We should find new perspectives. Uh, and I think it goes for the West that uh, we can't go on living like this. We can't go on thinking like this, because uh, it will either be war or it'll be dead end alleys and it'll be conflicts everywhere. You can look. I think as a person from the West, I think it's sad to look at, at Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, and those countries, Syria to some extent also, where the Western has tried to make some kind of regime change or decide what happened. They're not successful. I think it, it, it's obvious for all. 
and, and we need some new way of thinking. And you are, uh, well, what the Schiller Institute has come up with is a very, very interesting in this perspective, I think. Actually, when you speak about not changing other people, one of our biggest uh, points is that we actually have to challenge ourselves to change ourselves <clears throat> yeah. to, to really strive for developing our creative potential and to make a contribution that will have potentially international implications. Yes, definitely. So, yeah, yeah. So we, we, the Schiller Institute is on full mobilization during the next couple of weeks to try to get the United States and NATO to negotiate seriously. And uh, Helga Tsepp LaRouche has called on uh, U.S. and NATO to sign these treaties that uh, Russia has proposed and to pursue other uh, avenues of preventing nuclear yeah. war. So we hope that you, our seers, sure, will also do everything that you can, uh, including circulating this video. Sure. Uh, is there anything else you would like to say to our seers uh, before we end, Jens Jern? No, uh, no. I think we have talked a lot now. Uh, no, uh, only I think what, what what you said about this to, to bring uh, USA and Russia to to the negotiation table. It's it's obvious. I think that it should be for any prudent, any uh, clear thinking person in the West. It should be obvious that this is the only right thing to do. So of course we support it one hundred percent. Okay. Thank you so much, Jens Nielsen. I thank you. Thank you.